personal success and tragedy. What are your personal definitions of those two terms? I know all of you must have your own experiences with those two terms. I know I certainly have, and the two women I'm going to introduce to you have had theirs as well. So just keep your own personal definitions in mind as I uh, introduce them to you today. And um, uh, I have a radio show, and that's where I met these two women. And I've interviewed guests from around the world on this show. And these women have um, endured an in, in unimaginable tragedy, and, and and uh, incredible success has come from that in that unimaginable tragedy. And I guess I'm just going to ask you to maybe look beyond their circumstances and look to the emotion that each of the, the uh, women have, and you have, um, I'm sorry, I'm just a little overwhelmed. Their stories are so, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for that. Their stories are so overwhelming that for them to ask me to bring them to you today um, and for you to actually want me to, to, to bring them to you is just really, is really inspiring. And what I want to say is all of you are going to have an emotional response to their, their situations. And that's good because I had an emotional response to them, and that's what brought, made me want to bring them to you today. So let me just get started with, with the women that I want to bring to you. The first woman is Rhonda Britton. Rhonda, at age 14, witnessed her parents' murder-suicide. Um, on Father's Day, her parents were going through a, a contentious divorce. Very contentious, obviously. And her father came to her mother's home where she was residing, and she um, encountered her father with a gun. Her father took the gun and shot her mother. He didn't kill her mother, though, right away, but he took that gun and, and pointed it right at Rhonda. Well, he didn't shoot Rhonda, fortunately, but he did take that gun and he shot her mother again dead, right in front of her. And then he took the gun and shot himself. And this was on Father's Day, and she was 14 years old. Well, as you can probably imagine, this was traumatic for Rhonda. This was absolutely a horrendous experience for anyone to, imagine, you know, to go through, but it was unimaginable for a 14-year-old. Well, for years, Rhonda was plagued by alcoholism, and she actually attempted suicide three times. But Rhonda, being a strong woman that she is, um, on that third suicide attempt, she had an awakening, a sort of awakening, where she thought, you know what? My life is worth living. My life is worth fighting for. I'm not going to attempt suicide again. I'm going to put up the alcohol, and I'm going to begin a journey toward healing, toward personal development, toward, toward gaining my life, not back, just, I mean, because she never had a life to begin with. She was going to gain a life to where she was going to live on her own. Well, what she did, she had been given a whole lot of therapy, self-help books, everything that you can imagine over the years. And she um, took all that and put it together and applied it to herself in a very personal way. She didn't just take a therapist's advice and put it to her own, um, put it in, and, and just apply it to herself, you know, as he said or she said. She didn't take a book and say, yes, that's the way I'm going to do this. She applied it to herself in a way that was meaningful to her. Well, this is um, an example, and this was when she was about 28 years old. So this was about 14 years after her parents' murder-suicide. So 
on the 20th anniversary of her parents' death, so she was about 34 at this time, um, her, um, she actually wrote letters to each of her parents. This was part of the therapy that she had initiated for herself. She um, wrote letters to each of her parents. They were sort of goodbye letters. She told them how much she loved them, how much she missed them, but that they weren't, that that situation was not gonna control her anymore. So she wrote letters and then went to the woods and burned those letters. As if to say, I'm releasing myself from my past. And what she did really was unshackle herself from her past. She took those shackles off her legs and she walked away a free woman essentially. Well, you know what happened? A lot of things happened for Rhonda. First of all, things started changing in Rhonda's life so rapidly that the people, ironically, the people who had wanted to help Rhonda all those years <laughs> had uh, wanted, uh, um, all of a sudden, wanted help from Rhonda. They wanted Rhonda to help them. So it was like this irony of the people who wanted to help her wanted to help them. So she did. This was the start of her becoming a life coach. So this was the infancy of her life coaching business. She started helping one person, then two people, then five people. Then it grew into what's called the Fearless Living Institute. Well, it, it grew so big that it caught the attention of someone very influential and very important. Oprah Winfrey. Rhonda appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show three times to tell her story. She connected with viewers. She got on the show, probably was just as nervous as I am, <laughs> to tell her story. And, you know, all these emotions came out. And when I was interviewing her for this talk, so much emotion was coming out. And, and I just want to do these women justice. I have two women that I'm sharing with you today, and I want to do their stories justice. So I came out on the stage just ready to give it my all, and I want to do that to give these women justice. You know. So she came on the Oprah Winfrey Show. Here she is with Oprah um, on Oprah's famous couch. <laughs> <laughs> and and a lot of open, you can imagine a lot of doors open, open for Rhonda. She became... The New York Times, America's favorite life coach, she was named. Uh, she actually then started in the United Kingdom a uh, reality show called Help Me Rhonda for two seasons there in the United Kingdom. But then, most remarkably, uh, she appeared for three seasons on the NBC reality hit called Starting Over, which appeared in 25 countries and won her an Emmy Award. So here is Rhonda at the Emmys with her Emmy Award. Rhonda overcame her fear and self-loathing and became an inspiration to millions through being on the Oprah, Oprah Winfrey show for three times, to the Starting Over show, which aired in 25 countries. But, but the, name, the title of my talk is Mountains and Valleys. And she was in the deepest valley that I could you know, only imagine. And she soared to the top. So. The next woman I want to introduce you to is Nancy Hogshead Makar. Nancy, at age 14, was the number one swimmer in the world in the women's 25 meter butterfly. And she trained intensely for four years when she was in high school for the 1980 Olympic Games that were supposed to be held in Moscow. Let me get a drink of water. So the Olympic Games were supposed to be held in Moscow. And she was training really, really hard for four years, all through high school. Well, as any of you know your history, you know that Moscow was in the Soviet Union at that time. And the United States boycotted those Olympics because 
the, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, which was against our political policy at the time. So it left Nancy and a whole lot of Olympic athletes in a lurch. Well, believe it or not, this is where her life became at a crossroads. Because at this time in, in, in athletic life for a woman, age 18 is when a woman was finished, washed up, believe it or not. This came from Nancy's interview. You did not go on to college as a woman in the 1980s, in 1980, 1981, except unless you are someone like Nancy Hogshead McCarr. So, in 19, and also in 1972, you're probably wondering about Title IX. Title IX was enacted in 1972, but it was not enforced even in 1980. It was rarely enforced. So, Duke University actually offered Nancy its first female swimming scholarship. It was the first in, it, in the school's history, and of course Nancy is one to, have, to make history, and she did. So she was at school, and she was getting acclimated to school. Like many of you who are here, um, you know how it was when you first got to school. This was around 1981, and you, you know, you got acclimated to your academics and your extracurriculars. That's what she was doing. Well, one evening, Nancy was jogging through campus, you know, as part of her training, and this man was jogging slowly toward her. Well, all these alarms in her head started going off. This man is not right. This man should not be here. This man is not right for my safety. And she was absolutely correct. Because the man grabbed her and forced her into an evergreen area. And, he, and Nancy struggled with him for 40 minutes. Because you have to understand that she wasn't just an average woman. She was in Olympic, she was in Olympic athletic shape. So she struggled with him for 40 minutes. So, eventually he overtook her, though. He was a very large man. And he, he dragged her to a wooded area that was behind the evergreen area. And for two hours, he brutally and violently raped her. This is the newspaper article from Duke from 1981, November of 1981, that Nancy shared with me, to share, to share with you, that, um, that, that was um, published. The police were very vigilant in trying to catch her attacker, but they never did. Her assailant, from all we know, remains free. She over... Okay, um, she was um, suffering from uh, severe post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm sure you could only imagine or possibly relate. Um, her academics suffered, her personal life suffered, and of course, her athletic life suffered. She would not get back in the pool. Even when she healed physically, she could not get back in the pool. But after many, many months, as I said, she's a great woman. And she's a woman of many firsts. And you can't keep a great woman down. So she started to get back in the pool. And then she was practicing once a day. And then she was practicing twice a day. She was doing two a days. And then, all of a sudden, she was holding the third best time in the country in one of her events. So that was pretty amazing. I mean, she's a, a tr an amazing athlete and was born to be, was born to be an athlete. So um, she, was, she had to make a decision, though. Did she want to go for the 1984 Olympic Games to be held in Los Angeles? Well, she came to the conclusion, yes, she did. But she had to call, call upon her family and her swim coaches because it takes an army to get to the Olympics. You don't just go to the Olympics. You, you know, you 
you have to you have to take a lot of people with you. And her coach's goal was always to get Nancy to the 84 Olympics. Well, of course she went to the Olympics. And do you want to know how she did? <laughs> Three gold medals, one silver, and a fourth place finish. And those gold medals were in the 100 meter freestyle, the 4x100 meter medley relay, and the 4x100 freestyle relay. She did a silver in the 200 meter medley relay and the fourth place 200 meter butterfly. That was the fourth place finish. So here is Nancy with all of her gold medals, or her, all of her medals, the three gold and the one silver. So today, Nancy is a civil rights attorney, and actually, in the interest of full, full disclosure, she was a, a, um, a law professor, and she was my law professor, and she was my first law professor on the, my first day of law school. So she and, and she was my mentor, so she and I have a special bond and have stayed in, in touch ever since. So in Title IX, you cannot find a, a, a greater expert on Title IX in the country than Nancy Hogshead Maycar. She's a champion of women's causes in a variety of roles. Um, she heads up a multitude of organizations. Um, and most significantly, um, the International uh, Olympic Committee just last December of 2014 named her the woman, woman, it's woman of the year in Monaco. So that was a, and it was, she got all kinds of press. Um, there was press everywhere about her getting that, so. And now she is a happily married mother of three beautiful and outstanding children. So this is Nancy today with her, with her gorgeous children and her wonderful husband. Uh, Nancy overcame a violent rape and then soared to the top of the mountain to Olympic gold and so much more. So just to conclude, tragedy can be overcome and success can be achieved. I know that sounds really kind of elementary, just you know, like a, some sort of platitude or something that's just something you say that tragedy can be overcome and success can be achieved. But I believe I've demonstrated it today with these, woman, these women's stories that have been so, um, they're so, they're, they're, they're the, the poles of, you know, of success and, and tragedy. And I believe that resilience is one of the themes of today's talk as well, is that these women were resilient and they didn't give up. And resilience has defined these women's stories and it can define all of your stories as well. So thank you.